Okay, thank you everyone. We will now proceed to the uh, public comments section of our present of our meeting. Um, so let me begin by saying that at the onset, I want to uh, welcome and thank the public comment speakers for addressing the community today. All the speakers today were uh, submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. For the speakers specifically, we have a limited period for the public comment session. And in order to make it through all of the listed speakers, it's extremely important that you stick to the limits uh, proposed for, pro provided for each speaker. Um, and this is three minutes. Uh, there'll be a timer displayed on the screen that will cycle through three colors. And as you reach the end of your time, I will say thank you for your comment. Your time has expired. If you extend past that by 15 seconds, I will state as a courtesy to other speakers, we ask that you conclude your comment. And then if you go 30 seconds past your allotted time, uh, I will state your comment time has ended. Thank you and your microphone will be cut. So again, thank our, uh, we'd like to thank our speakers and we look forward to your comments. And so I'm going to ask um, Mr. Chuck Sheldon to please come to the microphone. Mr. Sheldon. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Please go forward. Great. My name is Chuck Sheldon. I want to address the mRNA COVID vaccines. I have a BA and MA in biology and years of medical research at Stanford. This committee did exemplary work yesterday examining most of the COVID vaccine benefit risk equation. Yet risks of the mRNA vaccines to some groups, such as minors, pregnant women, women and the unborn are still largely unknown. Since one, all the trials have been very short. Two, most trials have excluded children and pregnant women. Three, many trials no longer have controls, which are essential to real science. So I ask you, have we here neglected the unknown risks? Some scientists see risks that may seem too terrible to contemplate, contemplate, but nevertheless are this committee's responsibility on behalf of all Americans. Example, has anyone here studied or proved whether the spike proteins generated by the mRNA vaccines could act as prions in the brain? Logically, that kind of risk should vastly outweigh the virtually non-existent risk of COVID-19 in almost everyone under age 30. Let's consider collective immunity. Immunization may not be able to achieve collective immunity without those who choose not to participate. But low-risk collective immunity can be achieved via both children and adults as follows. First, children. Most teenagers and children can contribute essentially risk-free by passively tolerating natural COVID-19 infection, which poses almost no risk to them in the absence of underlying conditions. Second, adults. Those adults who passively become infected will contribute via natural immunity and can protect themselves from serious adverse effects by using known effective countermeasures, both prophylactically and as early treatments, usually at home. Proven effective protocols include the nutraceuticals zinc, vitamin D, NAD, and glutathione, and the off-label use of HCQ or ivermectin. Both have ample safety records and have been found very effective with early treatment against COVID-19. 64 to 78% symptom reduction and 72 to 81% mortality reduction. This is based on ample studies. In round numbers, HCQ has, has had 3,000 studies with 400,000 participants and 150 RCTs. Ivermectin has had 250 studies with 20,000 patients and 35 RCTs. These figures are available to anyone at c19early.com, c19early.com. In most cases, COVID disease with these early interventions does not require hospitalization, thus conserving critical resources. In summary, even those taking public, even taking public health risks into consideration those under 30 have effective and far safer alternatives to using the mRNA vaccines. We all do. Please protect our young people by weighing risks against, uh, based on the scientific method, by not relying on trials from the, uh, and I'm sorry, not relying on trials that lack proper controls, and by not excluding unknown risks from the cost. Thank you for your equation. comment. Your time has expired. Our next speaker is Jennifer Vincent. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, please. Go forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my comment. My name is Jennifer Vincent, and I'm calling from California. 
I have a medical and a scientific background. Today, however, I'm commenting as a parent and a community member. I'm asking this committee to suspend the interim authorization for COVID vaccines for youth ages 12 and older and to not authorize COVID vaccines for younger children until long-term safety studies have been completed. Children are not the primary source of transmission of COVID-19. They have a 99.998% chance of surviving COVID-19. There is no emergency in regards to COVID-19 in children. Additionally, we have successful treatments available, although those treatments have been purposely suppressed. I find this committee quick to say that side effects are a rare occurrence. However, it is only rare until it happens to your child or loved one. The news media and social media are filled with first-hand accounts of youth and adults with severe side effects, including death attributed to COVID-19 vaccines. No sooner does Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Google delete one that a new one pops up. More and more physicians and scientists are coming forward to express their concerns about the safety of these vaccines and long-term safety studies. But again, these doctors' voices are silenced by the media. I suspect that the urging of the pharmaceutical industry. I have reason to believe that many people are not given proper informed consent and do not understand that these vaccines are only authorized under emergency use. They don't understand that they are now a part of the long-term safety studies. Several states, including California, are using coercion to get people to take these experimental vaccines. Do you physicians on this committee feel it's ethical to pay people to take a vaccine that could potentially kill them? I have no confidence in any of the COVID vaccines. I've seen dozens of news reports about large numbers of fully vaccinated people testing positive for COVID-19. Despite the committee's statements that the benefits outweigh the risks of COVID vaccination, I would argue that none of the vaccines are safe or effective. Our children are not data points. They are living, breathing human beings. I would not allow any of my children to get a COVID vaccine as no long-term safety studies have been done. None. How can that be? I implore you to err on the side of caution for your fellow citizens, for our children, and not the pharmaceutical industry that donates heavily to the CDC Foundation. Please suspend the interim authorization for youth ages 12 and older and do not authorize COVID vaccines for younger children until long-term safety studies have been completed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Ms. Lori Simonelli, please. Ms. Simonelli. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I Okay, all right, um, time starts now. <laughs> a, pervi a perversion of public health ethics has incurred. This past week, the CDC diverted an established need of discovery on why 1,200 under 30-year-olds, primarily males, were acquiring myocarditis and pericarditis following administration of the Pfizer Biotech Moderna COVID vaccine. Publicly stating a rescheduling concerning this discussion due to observation of Juneteenth National Independence Day. I fail to believe that even one celebratory participant of Juneteenth would say, postpone these young people succumbing to heart inflammation until after our celebration. The WHO CDC's own statistics show that the African American population have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. Yet your excuse of whatever reason to postpone investigation is gave as justifiable by the Juneteenth celebration. Really? So myocarditis and pericarditis in young people under 30 is not relevant over a national holiday. I'd like the data of new cases in the pause that you chose to take. Your own quotes dismiss 1,200 incidents of heart inflammation by claiming it is rare with over 300 million shots given. This is where verbiage is essential. It's not 300 million shots administrated in this age group, but as of May, it was 600,000 shots. See how the math works you give? I certainly did. Some of these youth remain hospitalized, some in ICU, but as always, the CDC is triumphant in the greater good concept of public health, whereas this population doesn't even carry a huge risk factor compared to other populations in similar age groups. This young population were absent of comorbidities, basically healthy. 
This is a humanity issue now. The greater good is unacceptable. While a twisted campaign of the CDC's recommendations are shouted, jingled, charged, uh, changed often, pop-up vaccine centers in our stores, schools, places of worship, dot the landscape. Censorship is executed on any scientist, doctor, or citizen who dares question your voting personnel. We're declared misinfor- misinformed. My God teaches me that we are all equally valuable in his sight. If one is in danger, he leaves the 99 and helps that one. 1,200 young humans matter. Unfortunately, my my prior experience observing you tells me that only the greater good matters to you, and you will permit this vaccine to continue as post-market data surveillance. You can stop this now and do the right thing. These young people have faces, they are loved, and they matter. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Mr. Kerbit Kubitz. Hello. I am Kermit Kubitz, and I want to congratulate the ACIP and its members on the success of their review of vaccines for COVID-19 and support expansion of indicated populations to teens and others. As a result of the EUA for Pfizer and Moderna and rapid vaccination uptake, overall COVID-19 cases in the U.S. have been declining since January 2021. The San Francisco VA hospital where I was vaccinated was doing 400 veterans a day beginning in January. Vaccination of more than 170 million people has allowed the economy to recover, businesses to reopen, band concerts in the Corte Madera Town Park to resume, and monthly breakfast to restore a sense of community at my American Legion post in Larkspur, California. My two sisters over 80 have been successfully vaccinated but my nearly 90-year-old brother still resists vaccination due to misinformation. The unvaccinated are still at risk. The number of Utah residents in the hospital is rising, while Dr. Russell Binnick of University of Utah Health notes that nearly everyone in the hospital with COVID has not been vaccinated. The Cleveland Clinic study recently released found that more than 99% of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 weren't fully vaccinated. 60 to 65% of patients in the ICU at Mercy Hospital, Springfield, Missouri, were under 40. Young people must get vaccinated. The ACIP is also considering influenza formulations for the next flu season. The occurrence of a cluster of oseltamivir resistant and antigenically drifted influenza H1N1 cases suggest the need for continuous monitoring and attention to influenza. It also suggests the need for a universal flu vaccine. Recent studies suggest a chimeric hemagglutinin-based universal influenza vaccine may be in sight. NIH and other government agencies should aggressively pursue a universal flu vaccine with adjuvants if necessary to prevent new variants of H1N1, H5N1, H3N2, or other variants from becoming public health threats. See clinical trial NCT 0330050. The ACIP should also return to the topic of widespread hepatitis vaccine, which is highly transmissible. Keep up the good work, ACIP and CDC, to stem the current pandemic and prevent future public health threats. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our final speaker is uh, Rishan Golden. Hello, can you hear me? I can, please go forward. Thank you. My name is Rashan Golden. I'm the mother of two, and my husband and I are the founders of Haley's Heart, established after the death of our 20-year-old daughter, Haley, stolen 950 days ago from vaccine-induced grand mal seizures. Our days since are full of agony, but Haley's journalistic voice remains alive at haleysheart.com. Your recommend, recommended poisons forever changed Haley's life and our family's life. And nearly five years ago, we became informed and versed in the horrific truth, intentionally hidden from the public. 
unlike those paid to speak and counteract our realities. There are countless parents, families, and medical doctors who have for years brought to your attention the slaughter and death taking place daily, yet you arrogantly ignore and adamantly deny the immense loss and heartache happening to innocent children and adults. Legions have brought you the witnessing of ongoing horror and agonizing loss, and still you all choose to do nothing, only sometimes commenting, I'm sorry for your loss, which means nothing without action and meaningful change. Science confirms almost 80% of SIDS cases happen when multiple vaccines are given on the same day, and public-funded studies show children live in aluminum toxicity, with the government repeatedly refusing to do the studies or adhering to its own safety guidelines. Your silence and continued lack of conscience, as witnessed again yesterday, makes each of you complicit of murder, the unlawful killing of another from extreme and reckless disregard for life that results in death. Haley's beautiful life mattered, as do the countless others senselessly injured and tragically stolen. For years, this committee has been made fully aware of the truth, brought before you repeatedly. And today, my family and hundreds and thousands of others in this growing community stand together and we declare no more. We have been lied to for decades, but we are well-versed and very knowledgeable. We wear God's armor and we are prepared for this battle you created. We wear the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and we are strong in wisdom, truth, and love that comes only from goodness. I will pray for each of you, for I am to pray for my enemies. But remember, each time you cash your paycheck, you bring home blood money. And each time you get the opportunity to hug a loved one, you remember my Haley, my family, and the countless others not able to do the same because of your recommendations increasingly mandated without exemption. A business owner of 27 years, I'm now a certified natural health practitioner and soon practicing naturopath, which means I'm a teacher. And I assure you and those alike that I will teach truth about humans who are wonderfully and fearfully made and supported with nature's treasures, having no need for your liability-free neurotoxic poisons that bring in trillions for fraudulent makers and their cohorts. Your days of abuse, neglect, and tyranny are soon coming to an end. In closing, it is through our shattered hearts that we choose truth and kindness to honor our loved ones. Thank you for and your comments. Your time is expired. You to make things right, for you too will someday stand before your maker and give account for the monumental injury and massive death of God's children, and that you were told about but repeatedly chose to ignore and disregard. May God help As you all. As a courtesy to other speakers, we ask that you conclude your comment. Thank you. Uh, we uh, will take a break now and return at uh, uh, half past the hour, please. Half past the hour to begin votes. <laughs> 